Church family, if the planted sermon series was a series that was designed by the Holy Spirit to get us to see results, to get us to produce fruit, because frustration is imminent when you keep on doing things and seeing no fruit, then this Trap House series, our second series of the 2023 calendar year, this series' objective is twofold. Number one, this series is designed to get us to move with freedom. Can I get somebody to say freedom? freedom. Move with freedom because there's a difference between a slave that has escaped and a slave who has been set free. Wow. See, the slave that has escaped is constantly tormented and haunted if the master that used to have them bound is ever going to catch them and bring them back to the plantation. Let me make it make sense. I'm worried and I'm concerned if the master of pornography is going to bring me back to go to those websites. I'm concerned if the master of hookah is going to grab me and take me back to the hookah bar. I'm concerned if the master of getting high, y'all don't want to talk to me, is going to grab me and take me back to the things that I've been enslaved to. That's when you have escaped. But when a slave is free, they're not worried about what's behind them. They're not worried about their past because they recognize who the son has set free is free indeed. If you see me walking like this, it's because I've been set free. If you see me worshiping like this, it's because I've been set free. Now, I want us to understand this, though. Hold on. Freedom is not resisting the desire to carry it out. That's a struggle. Okay. All of us have had or currently have struggles. We know that's unhealthy and we're asking God to renew us. We want to be free from it and God has us in a regenerating process. You're not out of the cocoon yet. You haven't experienced your wings yet, but you're no longer crawling like you used to. You find yourself in the middle. It might tempt you if you smell black and mild. It might tempt you if you go to the beach during spring break. It might still tempt you, and you have to be honest with yourself, to recognize I'm being regenerated. So freedom is not just resisting carrying out that desire. Freedom is when your taste buds have changed. It's when I don't even want to get high. I used to be a weed head, but I don't even want to get high anymore. Like, I don't even desire it. I don't even want to get drunk for spring break. I used to pull up, drink, pass out, drink, <laughs> headshot, drink. I used to do that. Now I want, like, okay, for the men's conference, do y'all need any help? Do y'all need any volunteers? I'm not trying to pull up. I'm trying to lift up the name of Jesus. I don't even desire it anymore. It's not a struggle for me to maintain my purity. I want to wait until I get married. That is truly freedom. Freedom. This, this series is designed. If you're not there, that's okay. By the time this series is over, by the grace of God, we'll experience freedom in areas. This series is designed to get us to move with freedom. And number two, move with discernment. Discernment. See, it's one thing to move with anxiety. It's one thing to move with trauma. It's one thing to move with bitterness. It's another thing to move with clarity. It's another thing to move with vision. It's another thing to move with purpose. It's another thing to move with being free from being a people pleaser. Because when you understand who you are, you recognize I don't have to become a bite-sized version of myself so that I'm easier for them to digest. Sometimes walking in purpose is going to make some people choke. <laughs> Sometimes walking in purpose is going to cause for some people not to be able to handle you. And that's okay. I'm not doing this for your acceptance. I'm doing this out of obedience. See, this is why. This is why I do therapy Thursday. Because I recognize people pleasers usually start off as parent pleasers. Okay. All right? I've only been up here about five minutes. <laughs> people pleasers usually start off as parent pleasers. Somehow in your childhood, you learned to be needed is to be loved. 
Why do I keep attracting needy people? It's because you were trained and discipled as a child to be needed is to be loved. So I don't feel loved unless I'm needed. And so I keep on confusing my contribution as confirmation. So good, y'all. I think this is God when I can contribute to it. Because I learned to be needed is to be loved. We need healing from that. Healing from that so you can recognize even if you don't love me, God loves me and I love me. So we have to deal with that during therapy so we can move with freedom and move with discernment so that we know how to identify traps in the middle because transition season please hear me transition season will feel like a delayed season when you keep on falling into traps some of us who feel like whatever you're asking for is delayed what if I were to tell you it's not delayed you're just in a trap You're in a trap, traps in hallways. And I want to show us this from our foundational text, starting with Jesus so that we could really understand how this looks. Luke chapter four, verse three. If you got it, would you shout at me as loud as you can? I'm here. I'm here. So it says, the devil said to him, speaking to Jesus, the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, Command these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The devil's like, all right, okay. Um, So taking him on a high mountain, showing him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Be careful for those who want platforms. The devil said to him, all this authority... I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever wants followers. I'm sorry. I give it (laughs) to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, and it's something if you're the son of God, but now you're saying worship me. Okay. If you will worship before me, All will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle. The pinnacle is the top. I'm telling you, be aware of those who constantly want to get to the top. Because we're seeing the enemy loves to take you to the Okay, Then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, commit suicide. If you're the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in their hands, they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now, we have to pause right here. Pause right here. I got to break this down. Right here, the devil is quoting Psalms 91, specifically verses 11 and 12. The devil is quoting Psalms 91. Okay, let me go to the left side. Right here in our foundational text, we see that the devil is quoting the text. Specifically, Psalms 91, verses 11 and 12. Right side, let me come over to y'all. Right here... In the Bible, we're seeing that the devil is quoting the Bible. Specifically, Psalms 91, verses 11 and 12. And you telling me you impressed because they know Bible? You're telling me you're impressed that they quote scripture? But Pastor, you don't understand. He's a godly man, though. You don't understand. He got Ephesians 5 in his bio. You don't understand. He be like serving in church and be a musician, and he always be there. He's a godly man. You don't understand. Yeah, Pastor, you don't stand, bro. She different. She like Proverbs 31. She like got tatted on her arm. Charm is deceptive. Beauty is fleeting. But a woman who loves the Lord is worthy to be praised. You don't understand. She got God in her bio. And I'm like, um, 
God in their bio does not mean God in their life. You see that, Miss Flower? See? Oh, y'all quiet on this side. <laughs> yeah. God in their bio does not mean God in their life. This passage of scripture preached to me three profound things that I learned throughout my Christian journey. You want to know what they are? The first thing this passage taught me is good haters always leave out the good part. <laughs> good haters Always leave out the good part. Like if you're going to bad mouth me, talk about the good stuff Jerry did too. Talk about that time that one sermon blessed you too. Right? We leave out the good part. So if the devil knows Psalms 91 verses 11 and 12, this means he also knows in the Bible where it says he's a defeated foe. This also means that he knows in the Bible that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. This means that he also knows in the Bible, I will be blessed in my going and blessed in my coming. This means that he also knows in the Bible that we have been given the power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the works of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. This means he also knows even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. This means he also knows my God will never leave me nor forsake me. This means he also knows the greater works that he has done, we shall do. This means he also knows that we will heal the sick, that we will cast out devils. He just doesn't want you to know it. Preach, Holy Ghost. He knows the Bible. Do you? Because good haters leave out the good parts. That, that's the first part. Right, sis, that part. <laughs> the second thing that this shows me, we're just in our foundational text. We haven't read it all yet. The second thing that we can learn from this is that just because they know God's word doesn't mean they're godly. Yeah. Satan is quoting Psalms 91. Are you impressed with the devil that knows the Bible? Hmm. Just because they know God's word doesn't mean they're godly. And the third thing that this shows me is that interpretation, application, and context matters. See, the power of the scriptures is when it's exegeted accurately. Interpretation, application, and context matters matters because ooh, it's devil-like for you to try to use the Bible to justify your sin. Ooh, Lord have mercy. Did y'all hear what I just said? It's devil-like. Let me make it sting even more. It's satanic for you to find a scripture to try to justify your sin. Only God can judge me. I told us that's Tupac, not scripture. <laughs> Right? Actually, the Bible says judge a tree by the fruit it bears. Technically, everybody could judge you. It's only God who could sentence you. See? This, this is how we have exegesis and eisegesis. I have to do this because I want us to be a learned people. I want us to have biblical intelligence so if a Jehovah Witness knocks you on your door, you won't start doubting your faith because you don't know your Bible. I don't care if I get emails about it. I want us to be educated Christians that know the word, not just because I said it. I want you to read the Bible outside of me saying, turn your Bible to Matthew such and such. So I want to teach you how to study the Bible, and how to exegete appropriately. See, exegesis is when I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to cause for me to come in agreement with Scripture. Amen. Eisegesis is when I come to the Bible to try to make it come in agreement with me. Wow. All right? Exegesis is when I approach a Scripture or a text, and I ask these questions. What is being said? What does it mean? And what is the context? Who wrote it? Why they wrote it? Who are they talking to? And how do I apply this to my life? I'm giving you cheat codes already. 
When you come to the Bible, when you read your text, see, some of us say, I read my Bible. If I ask you, what did you read? You couldn't tell me. What was it talking about? Exegesis is, what does it mean? What does it say? What is the context of it? And how do I apply this to my life? Eisegesis is coming to a text already with an idea and trying to make that idea come in agreement with the scriptures. Does that make sense? I want to put my foot on the gas even more so that we can get it. Second Chronicles chapter 27. I want to give you an example of this. Second Chronicles chapter 27 verse 1. It says, Jotham was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jerashah, the daughter of Zodak. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzzah had done, although he did not enter the temple of the Lord. So, pastor, post-pandemic, wants his church people to come back. They're not coming to church. They're just watching online. And so what he will do is he will grab this text and emphasize the part, although he did not come to the temple of the Lord. That's what's wrong with y'all millennials. He was, what, 25? That's what's wrong with y'all millennials and Gen Z. Y'all don't come to church. There's power in the house, and there's healing in the house. All that is true, but it's taken out of context. Sounds good because I opened the Bible with an idea and tried to find what scripture matches my idea. This is so good, y'all. But if you have exegesis, somebody say exegesis, you go to 2 Chronicles 26. Okay, why did his daddy go to the temple? All right. Verse um, 16, 2 Chronicles 26, verse 16. It says, but after Uzzah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord, his God, and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Azariah, the the priest with 80 other courageous priests of the Lord, followed him in. They confronted the king and said, it is not right for you to burn incense to the Lord. That is for the priest. Okay, so you have to understand the incense, all that was, was symbolic of prayer. The smoke was going up, symbolic of prayer. We don't have to do that anymore because since Jesus died on the cross and resurrected from the grave, the veil has been torn. So we have our prayers automatically. We have access once we accept Jesus and come to him boldly before the throne of grace. Okay? That's all it was. So this was something that was assigned to the priest to do. So when the text says he did not go to the temple like his father, it was really saying he did the right thing. But you wouldn't have got that if you didn't exegete it. Interpretation, application, and context matter. Somebody shout it matters. matters. (laughs) Now if we go back to our foundational text, all that was just from that one verse. If we go back to our foundational text, Verse 10, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed him, watch this y'all, until an opportune time. So, So Jesus is no longer a baby in a manger. But he's yet to announce himself to the world as the Messiah. He's no longer the boy in the temple. And he has yet to announce himself as the son of man. He finds himself right in a hallway. I'm not who I once was, but I haven't declared who I'm going to be, I'm right in a hallway, and what does hell do when you're in a hallway? He provides you with traps. Traps. I want to speak around this thought from this subject for part one of our brand new sermon series, Trap House. Traps in the hallway. 
traps in the hallway. Right when you're in the middle, there's a trap. Right when you're transitioning, there's a trap. Right when you're about to, there's a trap. You haven't yet, you're no longer right in that place. There is trap. And we can see if Jesus, before he announced himself to the world, had to overcome traps, what makes you think that the enemy doesn't have traps for you? Can I get us to say this? I want us to speak this over ourselves. Can I get everybody to say, Father? Father. Watching online, put this in the room in all caps. Can I get us to say, Father? Father. Help me to remember, me to remember that, you that you order my steps and my stops. And my stops. I'll, embrace I'll embrace the hallway. One more time. Father, Father. Help, me to remember help me to remember that you order my steps, order my steps and my stops. And my stops. I'll embrace the hallway, the hallway, the hallway, the middle, the middle, the hallway, the middle, transition season, the hallway, the middle. I'm no longer the baby, but I've yet to raise Lazarus from the grave. I'm no longer the boy that's teaching and blowing the mind of Pharisees and Sadducees and the teachers of the law, but I have yet to give sight to the blind and to heal the sick and to cast out devils. I'm right in the hallway. See, I think the church has done a wonderful job preaching to us about open doors. We shout about it. We thank God for it. We knuck and buck. And that was awesome. We're grateful for it. We've done a great job with that. We've also done a great job with preaching about closed doors. That wasn't rejection, that was protection. And we shout about it and knuck and buck and say church was awesome and we're grateful for it. We've also done a pretty decent job with telling people to wait and to trust the timing of God and to wait on the Lord. We've done a great job with that and we shout and we receive it and knuck and buck. But I'm like, I don't think we have taught people how to steward the hallway with discernment. Not just trusting and waiting, but how to have discernment while you're in the hallway. Not praying to get out, but stewarding while you're in. And not just stewarding, stewarding it while you're in it, but having keen discernment right in the middle. While you're in transition, you have enough biblical and spiritual intelligence not to fall for traps. Not to fall for traps. And this messed me up, y'all. As I was preparing for this message, Isaac came in, gave me a week to really just prepare and think. I saw something. And I said, man, why haven't we been preaching this part? I noticed the greatest wonders and the greatest works of God aren't performed when you get there. Interwoven all throughout the fabric of Scripture. Y'all, this blew my mind. Mind blown. If you really study the text, when God shows off the most, it's always along the way. We've been praying, I can't wait until when I get there, I'll, when this happens. But if you read the Bible, you will see he does his most miraculous wonders along the way. The Red Sea did not crack in Canaan. The Red Sea did not crack in the promised land. It cracked along the way. While they were leaving Egypt, y'all better come get me. <laughs> While they were leaving Egypt and coming to Canaan, that's when God did the miraculous. Because God is notoriously known for doing his greatest wonders and performing his greatest miracles along the way. I'm going to keep going. The woman with the issue of blood, she didn't get her healing once Jesus got to Jairus' house. Jesus was on his way to Jairus' house. The woman with the issue of blood got her healing along the way. Because our God is notoriously known for doing his greatest wonders and performing his greatest miracles while we're along the way, in the middle, in transition, in the hallway. I'm going to keep going. Jacob's name was not changed to Israel once he and Esau reconciled. 
It was when he was leaving lots at Fort Jabbok when he was wrestling with the Lord. And he called this place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. That was before he got to Esau. Because our God is known and is notoriously known for doing his greatest miracles and performing his greatest wonders along the way. I'm going to keep going. The water turning to wine. I want y'all to get this. It didn't happen once Jesus said initially just pour it. It changed along the way because our God is notoriously known for performing his greatest miracles and his greatest wonders along the way. In the middle, in transition, during hallways, I'm going to keep on going. The lepers didn't get their miracle as soon as they came to Jesus. It happened as they went. Because God is notoriously known for performing the miracles in the middle, in transition. Uh Uh-oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. In fact, God loves the middle so much that his redemptive plan had him in the middle. In between a thief on the left and a thief on the right. And he's making a public spectacle of his enemies openly redeeming humanity while he is in the middle because God is notoriously known for performing his greatest wonders his greatest miracles along the way in transition in the middle while in a hallway so for anybody who finds himself in the middle of something right now the rest of you you can just sit there look cute and be quiet but for the rest of us who are in the middle of a divorce in the middle of a heartbreak in the middle of healing in the middle of overcoming, in the middle of a health challenge, in the middle of a crisis. This is the place you celebrate. We don't shout at the finish line, we shout right now. That's for middle people. The rest of y'all, y'all arrived, y'all got there. That's for those of us, I'm not there, but I haven't got there, I'm right here in the hallway. With this revelation, maybe we'll stop praying for there. Because we see in the text, he does it along the way. In the middle. In the hallway. I'm trying to help somebody who is frustrated with the transition. I'm trying to help somebody who's frustrated with being in between the blessing. I'm trying to help somebody who's frustrated with I'm not there, I'm not there, but how long do I got to be here? If I can get you to see, here is the necessary ingredients that God needs to do the miraculous. Maybe your prayers would change. God loves the hallway. But watch this, so does Satan. This is so good, Torrance. God loves the hallway. Why why does he love the hallway? Because he can show off. The hallway is the place of transformation and preparation. The hallway is your dressing room. It's where God is purging you from what was and preparing you for what is. See, those who are obsessed with there, you will recognize there never feels like there. Because there is just a ceiling to another floor. You'll never have joy because you're so caught up with there. God loves the hallway. In fact, let me break it down a little more. Right now, all of us in the earth, nature has all of us in a hallway. We are about to, in a few weeks, transition from winter to spring. So this means sometimes... It's going to be a frigid 34 degrees. (laughs) Then other times, it's going to be a comfortable 78 degrees. Sometimes, it's going to be an annoying, chilly, it was just hot yesterday, foggy, cold morning. You had your air on yesterday. You got your heat and seat warmer on today. (laughs) It's the discomfort of the middle. The middle. My wife said it this way. She said, man, Houston weather is like lottery numbers. 84, 25, 74, 46. It's the middle. Some days it's sunny and beautiful like today. 
And then other days, it is so cold. You're like, I live in Houston, right? I live, why, are we, why are we 20 something? I, I, live, I live in a Gulf Coast state, right? Some days it's beautiful, and then other days it's gonna be so humid, and there's gonna be so much pollen. Why did you wash your car? Why? There's, there's gonna be so much pollen agitating your allergies, you might think you have COVID. <laughs> but all of it is transitioning. See, go a little deeper. If you study it, I told you I love the Weather Channel. Storms get the most violent when seasons are changing. Because hot air and cold air, when they mix, they produce storms. The reason storms are so severe is because the air is unstable. Watch it. So what the enemy wants to do while we're in the hallway is he wants the instability of everything around you to cause for there to be instability within you because you're so tired of 3478, you'll fall for a trap. Because transition is uncomfortable. We got to catch a bus to come to that church. We, we had to go to the overflow. We had to, we're transitioning. Seriously, people don't like transitioning ministries. They like arrived ministries, seamless ministries. They don't like the discomfort, but something is happening along the way. For those of us who are in it, we see something is happening in the middle because God is notoriously known. For doing his greatest wonders along the way. Hallways come with discomfort. Y'all not about to like the next seven minutes of this message. Hallways come with discomfort. And discomfort exposes habits. Say it one more time. Hallways come with discomfort. And discomfort exposes habits. All of us, everybody under the sound of my voice, from the pulpit to the chairs and everybody watching online, all of us are a compilation of our habits. Where you are today is due to the habits you had yesterday. Where you are today is due to the habits that you had last year, 2022, 2023, 2021. The way you are today is due to all of your habits. First, you make choices. Then your choices make habits, and then your habits make you. This is so good, y'all. First, you make choices. Then your choices make habits, and then your habits make you. You're never going to arrive at the level of your goal. You're never going to arrive at the level of your calling until you address the level of your habit. I want to change though. Okay, change is the outcome of a thousand choices. I want to change. Change is the outcome of a hundred choices. Everyone counted. Every single choice counted. You either deal with your habits or your hallways will. Your habits. Your habits. Now, habits by themselves aren't inherently evil. They're only evil when God doesn't have them. See, like, if you have a habit of prayer, when you're in a hallway, remember, discomfort exposes habits. When you have a habit of prayer, when you get uncomfortable, that habit comes out. When you have a habit of fasting, when you get uncomfortable, that habit comes out. Uh Uh-oh. But when you have a habit of complaining. Yeah, I told you, Josh, they ain't going to like this. When you have a habit of complaining, we got to catch the bus, that habit comes out. Make sense? When I have a habit of when I have a hard day, I go to the alcoholic beverage aisle, and I have to find me some Bacardi, or I have to find me some drink. When that is your habit, when God is trying to disciple you, chisel you, change you, and it gets uncomfortable, your habit comes out. And what God is trying to do is say, okay, some of us, our habits are making us get in traps. It's not Satan, it's your habit. Your habit causes for you to go back. The devil didn't tempt you, your habit just never got dealt with. Can I go a little deeper? I want to show you all this in the text, okay? So so there's this this guy called Peter, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. Jesus is 
selecting his disciples. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, it says, As Jesus was walking beside the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother, Andrew, and they were casting nets. They were casting the net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Somebody say nets. Nets. Habits. Habits. They were casting their nets, for they were fishermen. Jesus comes along and says, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Certain translations say fishers of men. And then the text says, they dropped their nets and followed him. Now, before Jesus, they had a habit. Their net, it's crazy, y'all. The word snare in the Greek means net. It literally means in Hebrew, captured. Before Jesus, they had a habit. And I'm casting my net. I'm minding my own business. I'm clubbing. I'm doing my own thing. I'm drinking. Because I have my own habit. I meet Jesus and I leave my habit. Hmm. When Jesus said, come follow me, you know what he was really saying? Come let me level up your life. You're used to using that. I'm going to use your life to catch men. Let, Let me level up your life. How about let me level up your joy? Come follow me. Let me level up your peace. Come follow me. You can't sleep at night and you're tired of taking those sleeping pills and Z-Quil and all of that? Come follow me so I can give you some peace. You're tired of being depressed? Come follow me. Your habit's going to get left behind if you come follow me. Peter, I'm going to surround you with kingdom friends. Anybody want those kingdom friends? Not just friends that will agree with you. How about this? How about anointed friends? See, anointing means, anointing means chosen, and the anointing breaks yokes. So when I have anointed friends, I have chosen friends, how about you have a homie that can break stuff off you? You have a dude you can call and say, hey, I'm struggling tonight. Hey, come through. We're going to go to the gym. We're going to hoop. Somebody who will help you when you're in the hallway. Let me level up your life. You got used to toxicity. You just keep on eating lies, and then you wonder why your soul is thirsty for truth. Come follow me. I want to level up your life. Somebody say level up. Level up. So that, that's, that's all Jesus was really saying. Like, I want to level up your life. Now, Simon, the disciples, they walk with Jesus. Three years, Jesus gets killed. Along that process, Peter denied him. The rooster reminded him that he was a chicken by cockadoodle. He feels some type of way. He runs out crying. Three days later, Jesus gets up from the grave. Bittersweet moment because I'm excited. He he, he beat death, but I I betrayed him. Hmm. I wonder, is there anybody in the house watching online? You feel unworthy of the love of God. Can't do that. I used to be a stripper. I can't do that. He rose from the grave. That's great. But what makes me different from Judas? What what makes me different? I walked with him. I saw the wonders with him. But under pressure. Because hallways are uncomfortable. And remember, hallways are uncomfortable, and uncomfortability exposes habits. Look what the text says. Look what the text says. I want you to go to John chapter 21. You can just look on the screen. John chapter 21, verse 3. It says, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. Did anybody catch that? Matthew 4, he says, follow me, I'll make you Fishers of men. They're so excited that they leave their nets. Peter denies Jesus. And then after Jesus raised from the grave, shows himself to them. Look what it says. I'm going back to my habit. 
I'm going out to fish. And look how influential Peter is. Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. <laughs> because your friends usually share your habits. The only reason y'all are friends is because you have compatibility in the area of your habits. If your habits change, y'all won't be friends anymore. It's not anything bad. It just means you outgrew that habit. Right? We, we, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. The high don't hit anymore, does it? <laughs> Sleeping around doesn't feel as good anymore. Because when, when you meet Jesus, you can never sin the same again. You trying, though. It just doesn't feel as good anymore, does it? They caught nothing. Now, this is funny to me. I actually laughed when I read this. Verse 4 says, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not recognize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you any fish? <laughs> the reason it's funny, I'm like, bro, you know all things. Jesus know they ain't got no fish. He's like, hey, that ain't working anymore, is it? <laughs> yeah, that high don't satisfy anymore, huh? You had me, he doesn't feel as good anymore, does he? Yeah, you're trying to gamble, that don't hit anymore like it used to, does it? Yeah, you're going to the strip club, you feel bad now, it don't hit the same, does it? You got any fish? <laughs> See, that's like the comedy side of Jesus. I can just imagine Jesus, look, look at these boys, still can't. But remember, habits aren't inherently evil. Because once Jesus redeems them, he could use your habits for the kingdom. So look, look, look. He says, uh, hey, um, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your, not, your, throw your net on the right side. Let me use your habit. Y'all miss what I just said. Let me use it. Throw it on the right side, and then you will find some. Your abundance is tied to me redeeming your habit. Your freedom is tied to me redeeming your habit. This is so good, y'all. Can I use what you used to use so I can use it for the kingdom? Throws his net on the right side. And when they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. I know what it looks like when God is trying to get my attention. We tried all night. It wasn't working. But when we obey the king, we can't even haul in everything. God is trying to say, give me your habits. Give me your desires and watch me use your habits. I'll put it this way. I will give you the desires of your heart. Why? Because you have my heart. You want what I want. Habits, habits, the word trap in the Bible is often referred to as a snare. It's a snare. It's a snare. The devil knows, this is why he used traps, because he knows I don't have to fight hard against stuck people. I don't have to fight hard. Ooh, here come your edges. We are less of a threat to the kingdom of darkness when what hell is using as a snare, we call an opportunity. Did y'all hear what I just said? Oh, I got this great offer, man. I, I got this great opportunity. No, it's a trap. It's a trap. We are less a threat to the kingdom of darkness. It's about to get real, Josh. We are less a threat to the kingdom of darkness when what hell is using as a snare, we call bay. This is my bay. This is Zaddy. Spring break, we're about to go on vacation. Yeah, this, this, this is my shorty. If you have some spiritual insight, this is how you should introduce them. This is my snare. Not my snack, this is my trap. This is the trap the enemy used because I was lonely. 
This is the trap the enemy used because I was desperate. This is the trap the enemy used because I wasn't faithful to my wife. This is the trap. Less of a threat to the kingdom of darkness when what hell is using as a snare. We're calling it a promotion. I'm not preaching to you from a level I haven't been at. Back in 2019, my wife knows that I was offered several opportunities to be a pastor at different churches. I was just a student pastor, an assistant pastor, but I had a prayer life. And God told me in prayer, many doors are about to open before you and they won't be me. Stay close. Stay close. I'm telling the truth, y'all. God knows I'm being transparent. My wife is sitting right there. I said, 2019 is my basement year. Didn't I miss flowers? I said, I don't want no bookings. I don't want any opportunities. I'm going to just focus on being a better father, being a better husband, and being a better follower of Jesus. That's it. That's all I wanted. I don't, I don't want my name in lights or none of that. There was, I wasn't lead pastor then, but I got offers to be a pastor then. You know what traps are? Let me give you an acronym so that you can remember it. It's a trick right at pivots. Traps. They're tricks right at pivots. Whenever your life's about to pivot, there's a trick. Whenever your marriage is about to pivot, there's a trick. Whenever your esteem, your healing is about to pivot, there's a trick. And here's the thing. Me going to be a pastor in St. Louis wasn't evil. I would be telling them about Jesus. But you wouldn't be here right now. You wouldn't be here. I told my wife, I said, student pastor, I'm vacuuming in between the pews, changing ceiling tiles. I really was a church janitor. <laughs> Same anointing. Church janitor. I said, what do you, what do you think about this offer? They're going to take care of our house, our travel. We're going to be making almost $70,000 a year. I could preach every week. What do you think? She said, I think you need to stay still. My wife told me this. Thank God for a godly woman. Now, men, all men, I want you to listen to what I told her. I said, you think we should go? She said, I think you need to stay still. And I said, I'm going to submit to your authority. My God. I said that to my wife. Yeah. You the head. Yeah, but we submit to one another. Yeah. What I look like, submit to me, woman, and there's no resume of me submitting to her. Yeah. Miss Flowers, am I telling the truth? Yeah. I said, I'm, I'm going to submit to your authority. Yeah. Tricks right at Pivots. This is 2019. I had no idea a pandemic's about to happen. Wow. Yeah. Parents said, okay, we want to make you the lead pastor. You start a Thursday night service. Had no idea as soon as we started the service, pandemic was going to hit. Wow. And all we had was the cameras. And when everybody was quarantined, they had no choice but to start searching for somebody who's preaching the word. And there's this sweaty young black man trying to tell people about Jesus. Millions of views in a week. I can't make this up. I can't make this up. I didn't do nothing different. I didn't do nothing different. I just avoided tricks. Faithful. Where I was. So many of us, we're getting tripped up with Satan's offers because we're looking for high. And he's looking for those who want to go high. He's looking for those who want to be worshipped. He's looking for those who want platforms. He's looking for those who want pinnacles. He says, okay, if you worship me, I'll give that all to you. But I worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. I'm not telling you this because it sounds good. I'm telling you this because I lived it. I considered it, thought about it, but I had a kingdom voice in my ear. So I think you need to sit still. See, if the devil were to be an insect, you know an insect I think he would be? A spider. I think he'd be a spider. Carl, can you put this chart up on the screen for me? I think if the devil were to be an insect, he would be a spider. 
And you know what his web would be? Power, possessions, pride, pleasure, and pain. If he was a spider. I think this is how he would trap man. He would get us to want power. Not the Holy Spirit's power, but cultural power. If he was a spider, I believe he would get us with possessions. You think your identity is in what you got. You stress when your bank doesn't have a certain number. You feel some type of way over their car, their house. I would trip you up with possessions. Oh, and if I was the devil, I definitely would use pride. Because pride comes before a fall. I would use pleasure. You can't even get the doors God wants to give you because you have no zipper control. But pastor, he loved me. No, oh gosh, why am I doing this? It's not that he doesn't love you. You just feel better than his hand. You're better than porn to him. I am not sorry. My generation requires real. That's it. It's not just men's sisters too. He can't compete with, compete with your bullet. He can't. I will get you with pleasure. So you can't endure hallways that get uncomfortable because in secret, you give yourself pleasure. Wow. You hate to fast because it takes away the pleasure. Wow. But these kind only come out with prayer and fasting. But I would use my web of pleasure. I would use pain so that it would alter your personality. So that you can't love your neighbor as you love yourself because you don't love yourself. I would use pain. So you can't serve in church because you don't like people. Why do you want to go to heaven? What do you think going to be there? Be the only one in the corner. I'm good. I would use pain so that when God sends healers, you push them away too. I would use pain. So that you would seek out substances to try to sedate your pain versus seeking out the Savior. I would use pain. I would have you bitter over what your mama did so that you could pass it on to your daughter. I would use pain so that your children have to heal from having you as a parent. I would use pain. I would use it so you have to snort stuff, drink stuff to try to sedate yourself. I would use it. If I was the devil, I would be a spider be a spider. If we look at the methodology of the enemy, he shows us how he traps. Number one, he says, if you are the son of God, what is that? The trap of identity crisis. Please write this down. The first trap the enemy uses is the identity crisis trap. If you don't know who you are, you will respond to what you're not. Because I have an identity crisis. I feel like i got to prove something. Carl, could you, you show them this, this, this race of these greyhounds? I thought this was so funny, but I want you to see this. There, there's this picture of these greyhound dogs, right? They're sprinting with everything they got. Look at the cheetah. <laughs> cheetah chilling. You know why? Because when you know who you are, you're able to recognize, I don't have to prove none of you. In fact, this is an insult. I'm the fastest beast on the earth. You think I'm going to try to run with a greyhound? I'll smoke them. You laugh, but a lot of us are trying to prove ourselves on Instagram, prove yourself on Facebook, and that's not who you really are. You don't have organic joy. You don't have organic peace. Identity crisis. If you are the son of God, trap of identity. Second thing, the trap of appetite. What do you say? If you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Because when you don't know who you are, you'll end up eating wrong meals. Appetite. I want to take you next, but your appetite still wants Egypt. In fact, all of your friends eat Egypt. And you keep saying, I don't know why I feel so alone. I don't know why I'm just doing this Jesus thing all by myself. It's because you're surrounded by people who like Egypt meals. 
And friends always offer their diet. How many of us, honest, when you were fasting, somebody who wasn't offered you something that wasn't a part of the fast? Right? It's Taco Tuesday. You, we getting some, which one you want? Nah, I ain't doing it. Why? Just don't worry about it. Girl, I'm going to bring you back one anyway. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? But people who knew you were fasting and were fasting with you wouldn't offer you something that would make you weaker in your commitment. Are you really struggling? Or are you surrounded by Egypt friends? Wow. Trap of appetite. Number three, the trap of premature promotion. Look, look what the devil said. He said, all the kingdoms of the world I will give you if you worship me. What was Satan saying? I will crown you before he cross you. Jesus is saying, no, that's not how it works. I got to be crossed before I get crowned. Premature. I'm going to get all of it anyway. I just got to suffer first. So that I could raise with all power in my hand and say, oh, death, where's your sting? And have the keys of hell and of death. I can't have that first. The devil will always try to crown you and take away your cross. God will give you your cross before you ever get a crown. This is so powerful, y'all. The trap of premature promotion. And the last one, the trap of misused power. You're the son of God. Jump off this pinnacle. For it is written in Psalms 91, verses 11 and 12. He will give his angels in charge of you. Jesus has yet to show, heal the sick, raise Lazarus from the dead, walk on water. He hasn't done that yet. Satan is trying to get him to misuse power. I'm going to display my power, but not in the hallway. Have to avoid the traps first. I'm trying to help somebody who feels like they want to prove themselves and display. The hallway is for character. The hallway is for freedom. The worst thing you could ever have is spotlights on you in public, but chains on you in private. Embrace the hallway. God, right now, we're asking you. Whatever chain, whatever bondage, whatever net that we're holding on to, whatever snare that we're calling an opportunity, expose it. Give us spiritual insight so that we're able to see tricks right at pivotal points of our lives. We don't want to recover. We started this year off six weeks staying. We wanted to be planted. Now you're saying, okay, if you're planted, watch out for traps. Give us that heart. Give us that discernment to want your will more than we want ours. Keep us from the devil's web. And for those of us who are entangled, would you free us? Free us from the web. We don't want to keep on having this public presentation of freedom. But in secret, we're entangled with our own nets. In Jesus' name, we pray. We're asking you to do it. Amen. Amen. This word bless you on the day.